She would watch Star Trek every day. Oh, great. Isn't Joe Elton in this group? Isn't it December 17th, the Sunday? Unofficially, I don't know. Oh, great. At first, I wanted to know what you wanted to do on the board. So I think um, but the way it's been rolled well out, there's no way it's going to be a little bit of a mess. Because somebody's like, can you confirm the day and time? I'm like, can you get that? <laughs> 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 Yes, <laughs> sir. Hey, Larry. You're good. I'd like to call the Powhatan County Joint Board of Supervisors and School Board meeting to order. I'm going to lead us in the pledge, and I think Mr. Cole is going to lead us in the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together in this country at this time. Thank you for the many blessings that we enjoy. We pray that we may be ever mindful of those blessings and always responsive in a way that shows our gratefulness. We ask for your blessings tonight and your guidance as we meet tonight and every night that we may do your will work on behalf of the people of Bountain County. Amen. Amen. So uh, do we have any requests to postpone, add, or delete, change the order presentation on our agenda? Move to approve the agenda as presented, Mr. Chairman. Second. A motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Y'all need to approve your agenda? Yes, sir. So are there any requests to postpone agenda items, make additions or changes to the agenda for the school board as presented? I make a motion to accept the agenda. I have a motion to accept the agenda. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That motion carries 5-0. Ms. Wilson, if you'd let the uh, minutes reflect to that all the members of the school board are present this evening along with Dr. Jones. Thank you, ma'am. And so would you also uh, note the record that, not you, but Melissa, but our record that all five board of supervisors are present and our county administrator is. I will now move on to, for those in the public, first of all, our agendas are very similar. You'll see that. Uh, we don't, we, we do that to make sure we're being as consistent and fair, I guess. It's a good thing. Um, <coughs> we'll have our first couple public comment period, uh, and we'll be discussing up here tonight new business, the following topics, presentation of health benefits, discussion of Pocahontas Middle School repurposing, and construction project updates. So if you're here to speak tonight, on any of those, you could do it at the first public comment period before the board has any discussion, the boards have any discussion on those, or you can wait and hold them to, because we will have a second public comment period, but by all means, you can uh, speak. If you're here, uh, uh, I'll read the formal reading of this. So we're, this is the first of two public comment periods. We invite members of the public to share thoughts and matters and issues that are germane to county business. This is not a form for political campaign, campaigning or promoting a business. Please you keep your comments focused on the issues and subject matter over which the, these boards have responsibility. Please keep your comments to three minutes if you're speaking as an individual and five minutes if you're representing a group. And so that we can get your name and address correct in the minutes, could you please sign in with your name and address? And we're pretty liberal with our time rules, so we're not going to try to cut anybody off. We do want to hear from you. And I uh, see there's a couple good, good groups out there. Thank you. So. At this time, we'll open our first public uh, comment period. Anybody <coughs> wishing to speak, please come forward at this time. Mr. Walter, 
Mr. Voorhees, Dr. Jones, ladies and gentlemen of the school board and pull the, the pull mic in front of you a little closer. Thank you. I always thought I was talking loud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Carol Baltimore, and I'm speaking for the Christmas Mother Committee, which is also the CEC. We know that you have gotten all of our information, and a lot of information, in recent weeks. And we want to thank you, first of all, for considering our proposal about using part of the Pocahontas Middle School location as a home when the new middle school is opened in 2018. <coughs> we need a permanent location for many reasons all of those reasons being related to serving our community more effectively. We do that throughout the year. We need space in one place for storage of inventory, for management of operations, and as an office. Most people know us as providers for the services that we render during Christmas to the, to the people of Powhatan who are in need at that time. And it is one of the busiest times of the year for us. We work from August through January, and we, we start by choosing a new Christmas mother, and we end up by cleaning up all of the things that we have put out and taking them back to storage. Even as 2018 approaches now, we know that we're going to have additional requests for assistance throughout the winter and through the summer and we do that through the Department of Social Services, other agencies, and individuals who refer people to us that are in need of help because of an emergency or something that has happened in their families that they need to have uh, some more help. This year so far, <coughs> excuse me, so far, we have taken in 191 applications for help, 191. It's likely that more will come in before we finish on the 15th, and even after that, before Christmas. Of those 191, 149, which translates into 78% of those people, are below the 125% federal poverty level in Powhatan. We need to help those making the request by giving them clothing, household goods, other items, sometimes we pay for their heat in the winter time or their transportation to medical appointments or whatever the, their needs are. And we cannot get to our inventory that we have when we, they need physical things like home goods and clothing, you know, just to live uh, because it's in a storage unit and it is packed up and we have two storage units. We really want to be more effective, so we need some space. And we do this all year long. After we are through with the Christmas season, we do this February until the next August when we choose a new Christmas mother. In short, we need a location and that we can use August through January for Christmas and then for preparation for the next year with delivery of goods, storage of inventory, taking applications, which we do in October most of the time, and an office for conducting business. This is an all year-round operation. The Christmas Mother operation was set in motion, as most of you know, 50 years ago by a group of women who saw a need to help their neighbors. That is still our mission today. Thank you for your consideration as we move forward with what to do with the uh, facility that is the, now the Pocahontas Middle School. We hope we can be part of that decision, and we wish you a Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Y'all rehearsed that well. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Baltimore. Good evening. My name is Teresa Carver, and I don't usually do this stuff, but and I know Jim is out of town, but he doesn't, he wants to be heard anyway. <laughs> so he sent me. I have information he wanted to be passed out to everybody. Can we do that? And I have extras if anybody wants, wants copies. 
He wrote an email and then he wrote an article that may be published in the Powhatan today about the lodging, the motel and the apartment. Like Jim, I don't like, I don't think the locations for the apartment or the, the motels are good. We do not want to see the, zone, the areas rezoned so they can, so that these can be built or see the areas around the schools rezoned to commercial use. And we, there, we think there needs to be a way to let citizens know of such projects far sooner than we heard of these two. I admit I don't understand all the procedures, but with what Jim points out, how do the projects get this far without someone questioning it? And Jim's, valid, Jim's points are valid and need to be considerated. Consider it. Considered. <laughs> I support all that Jim says in the information and say no to a motel and apartment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carver, for your comments, and we thank Jim for his emails. Anyone else wishing to speak, please come forward at this time. Okay. We'll close our first public comment period and we'll move on to uh, item 10A, presentation of health benefits, found on page three of our packet. Um, and I guess Ms. Item will take this? Or? It's item 3A on the school board agenda. Yep. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, David Rowe is, uh, was supposed to be here today to help in this presentation, our benefits um, consultant. He is out sick. Uh, he notified Larry Johns this morning that he was not going to be able to make it. So Mr. Johns is going to be pinch hitting for him. Okay. Um, and they were going to do the presentation together anyway. But this is a presentation um, about um, cost trends that we are seeing and the impact for our renewal of health insurance in 2019 and also some options that have been discussed um, about ways to control those costs. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for your time this evening. Uh, as you all know, David Rowe is the uh, health insurance benefits consultant for both school and county. And each quarter, he meets with school and county staff and goes over our loss claim data, and we look forward to uh, what uh, the projections may be for the following year. Uh, based upon the last quarterly meeting and that projection, uh, we did have uh, that quarterly report presented to the school board. And uh, so part of that is uh, what uh, for tonight's presentation is what we've already covered with the uh, school board. Um, first, looking at the trend data, uh, in determining our uh, projected premiums uh, for the upcoming year, um, we take a look at the pay claims for a 12-month period as compared to the pay claims for a prior 12-month period. And so the periods that we're looking at right now is the 12 months period that uh, ended in uh, August uh, 17 as compared to the 12-month period ended in August 16. And uh, the first thing is the average employees, and this is both school and county employees. And so the participation has grown just a little bit from 590 to 624. <laughs> However, the next line, the paid medical claims, uh, is up 30%. Uh, they increased from 4.5 million to 5.9 million. Now, part of those claims are above our stop loss where um, uh, there's an uh, insurance policy that will pay for certain claims uh, above a certain amount. When you adjust the paid medical claims, we're still up 20%, 20.5%. Premiums, the collected premiums are up some. They're up 13% for two reasons. One, because uh, we have more employees participating, and two, because we did have a premium increase uh, during this period. And I want to point out that the paid medical claims on this second line do not include the health and dental cost uh, as well as uh, pharmacy cost and um, the uh, reinsurance administrative uh, fees. So uh, it, it'd be another uh, um, two and a half million dollars or so added to the total cost for this 12-month period if you would add those things. 
Larry, can we pause at, at yes, each page and answer the, ask any questions? Yes, mm -hmm. sir. So, so the cost went up uh, twenty percent after your rebate back, false claim, stop loss. Right. Did your number of claimants go up? Yes, it has. So the number of claimants went up, not just an increase in the cost of medical care. Yes, there there is much there is more usage, and one of the key factors. This next chart, a key factor that also drives that, which is d directly uh, in relation to your question. Um, this is just the number of claims over uh, $25,000, which are considered yeah. high-cost claims. That uh, number increased from 34 to 40, but when you look at the total cost of those claims, mm -hmm. that increased 58%. Mm -hmm. Went from $2.3 million to 3.6. So that is another factor that is driving uh, this cost up. Did you? Do you, were, you do any, were you able to do any data as a, as a result of an aging population of your employees, or just do you, can you tell? Um, I didn't look at it in that depth, and, I, and the age is not a factor that is presented to us on a quarterly basis. It's basically uh, the claims that were paid. I mean, the detail report gives the type of claims and all that kind of stuff, and for these high-cost claims shows you um, what they, you know, what they cost, uh, and what if they haven't been fully paid, what they're projected to cost. But um, we don't have necessarily we don't have age in the in the analysis. You probably couldn't look at it anyway. <laughs> that would be against the law. Right. I just know intuitively as I got older, I think I cost my company a little more than I did when I was in my 30s. So, and, and I do as well. So, <laughs> I can relate. Mr. Chairman, Mr. That Mr. Chairman, um, I do. If we want to start looking as closely as we can, we could look at the increase in the cost of medical procedures over that time, as well as um, pharmaceuticals, to see if there's any kind of correlation to um, we're paying out more. I know you just said we have more claims and more claimants, mm -hmm. um, but if we're paying out more, part of that could be the cost because it's been skyrocketing, especially pharmaceuticals. So I. And we wouldn't has. need to know anybody's information to find that out. Right, and it has. Uh, and, and I don't, in the quarterly reports that the county and school staff get, we don't get names with any of this. Mm -hmm. So right. we, we're just getting paid claims, so uh, we don't know names. But yes, the, uh, the uh, provider's rates are up. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Um, so. If we take the trend data and we project ahead to what we're going to look at for the uh, upcoming budget year, July 2018 to June 19, and that is the period that our policy runs as well. It's on a, a fiscal year basis. Our projected claims are, um, without the fees, are $6.1 million. When you add in the drug and dental costs, that's another $2 million. Uh, uh, the reinsurance charges are 678,000, and administrative fees and other things are 327. So you're looking at a projected cost of 9.1 million. If we kept premium rates the same, we're projecting to only be collecting 7.6 million, and so that's what's driving the 20 and a half percent increase. Uh, and I want to point out that this is a projected increase, and the actual number could be more, it could be less. What will happen is um, we will roll forward a quarter uh, for the period ending November 2017, and we will get a, a renewal quote either late February or, February or early March uh, telling us exactly what these premiums uh, will be going forward. And so if our claims data for the next quarter is higher, uh, this year than it was the last year, and we drop off a quarter, it'll be more. If it's less, um, it will uh, hopefully be less. But right now, 20 and a half percent is a high number, and it's mm -hmm. worth us all talking about. Now, some people may ask, you know, why don't we go out to bed and all that kind of stuff? And I uh, just wanted to rem I remind everyone that. 
Uh, we are participating with Anthem Local Choice, which is a state developed plan that was started in 1989. The school board has been on that plan since 1989, and that there are 140,000 employees represented in this plan. So there's no way we could take our five or 600 employees and go out to bid and compete with 140,000 employees. This chart illustrates the benefit of us being with a group of 140,000 employees. If you look at just the 10 year period of 2008 to 2017, you see the increases and decreases that we've had in premiums over that 10 year period. And that 10 year period average is just three and a half percent. And if you talk to anybody that has insurance out in the commercial market, that is great. Um, of course, the reason we're here tonight is that last column, that projected column of 20 and a half percent, because as you can see from this chart, that is a higher number than we have faced before. So that information was presented to the uh, school board uh, back in October. And um, if we are going to be looking at a 20 and a half percent increase, uh, the, call, the school board share of that increase uh, would exceed $700,000. That's a big ticket item. So um, we also, in October, October, talked with the school board about three potential cost control options, and I want to go over those with uh, uh, everyone tonight as well. Um, the school board at that meeting directed that we go out and brief all school division staff on these cost control options and then conduct a survey. We have done that. We completed our briefings on Friday. Uh, we have a survey app now, and uh, at this point in time, we've got about 200 people that have uh, participated in the survey. The uh, three options that we have discussed right now and that the school board is considering is first to implement a wellness program. Uh, second option is to provide an incentive for employees to move from either the Key Advantage Expanded Plan or the Key Advantage 500 to a high deductible plan and start a health savings account. The third item, or, or, option under consideration is to replace the um, Key Advantage Expanded Plan, the premium plan that we have, with a Key Advantage 250 plan. Now, that decision can only be made by both boards because we all are on the same policy, it has to be the same. So that means neither the school board or county could take this move on their own. We have to be unified uh, in that decision if that is what the two boards uh, decide to do. So to go over the options, the first <coughs> option is a wellness program. And this is just to provide an incentive for employees to live a healthier lifestyle. And what uh, would happen with that is there would be, employees would have to certify, have their doctor uh, complete a form and submit it uh, to us certifying that they have done their age-appropriate screenings and uh, also certify their uh, tobacco use uh, for both the spouse, I mean the employee and spouse, if the spouse is covered on our policy. And because of that, we would have a slightly lower rate for the employees that are participating in the wellness program as compared to the employees that are not. A lot of other employers that surround us have a, a plan such as this, the state has it, and uh, so that's uh, one of the options that we uh, have talked about. Larry, are you going? Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Larry, are you going to get into numbers on this later in your presentation? Yes, sir. So, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, the second option is to provide an incentive for employees to move to a high deductible uh, plan and uh, start a health savings account. And so both the employee and the employer would be uh, making deposits into that person's uh, health savings account. We already have a vendor uh, and a health savings account set up. American Fidelity is the vendor that has for years been 
managing our uh, flex spending uh, 125 plan. And they also, this past year, we started a health savings account. We have a few employees that already have health savings accounts set up, but uh, we're not providing any employer contribution um, to those. And, but this is the company that would provide this service for us going forward. Um, now, the, a health savings account has a lot of advantages over the uh, flex spending account under the IRS code 125. Um, there are much lower limits with the 125 plan, and you also must use or lose the dollars that you set aside under 125. Health savings account, the limits are uh, much higher. It is totally portable, uh, and that means that uh, you can accumulate those dollars uh, and, you know, leave us, retire, whatever, that goes with you. There is never a penalty for spending those dollars as long as you're spending them for a health um, uh, item. And so um, that is uh, the benefit there. Um, and to go into a few numbers, um, if, a, if an employee, and these, these um, numbers that I have right now, these are the current premiums that employees are paying, school board employees are paying uh, for the Key Advantage Expanded and the Key Advantage 500 plan. So just to go through the top line, an employee today pays $176 if they're employee only in the Key Advantage Expanded plan. That's $176 a month. If they went to the high deductible, they'd only be paying $10 a month, thereby savings $166 a month. The concept is for them to still set a, you know, pay 176, but 166 of that goes into their health savings account. The school board would then also make a contribution, and I've used $70 in this example, $70 a month. So at the end of the year, this employee would have $2,832 set aside in their health savings account to pay for their, you know, co-pays and deductibles and things like that. As you go down the column, if you're a key advantage expanded employee plus one, their savings at the end of the year is going to be $4,300. Family is $7,700. However, the limitations for 2018, a single employee only, the maximum amount you can set aside is $3,450. The maximum you can set aside for family is $6,800. So key advantage expanded family person would have to take a part of those dollars and um, uh, in their paycheck. But it works well for everyone else. It works well for the uh, Key Advantage Expanded Family as well. And um, for numbers purposes, the reason I use $70 is twofold. One is because I have a survey of, uh, it's two years old, but it is for the divisions around us that already have this uh, set up. And the average contribution that those school divisions were making was $69.43, so I used $70. The other reason I used it is because um, making this contribution, you know, I mean, that, those are dollars, and um, at the $70 range, there is no additional cost to the school board. It's just a reallocation of dollars because as the employee is saving money on their premium, so is the employer. And so it's just a reallocation of dollars. So this option would not be a cost to the school board. Now what employees have to do is they have to look at, the, uh, look at their sa potential savings and then look at the benefit differences uh, for these plans and say, is this the right choice for me? And so, I've just listed, you know, five of the benefit differences on this chart, but the benefit booklet for each of these plans is about 14 to 15 pages long. Uh, and then we also have a three-page comparison, side-by-side -side comparison of the benefits. We've got both those up on uh, our website for our staff access for them to go in and actually do the analysis for them. But if you just look, your um, uh, 
deductibles uh, go from $100 uh, to $2,800 or $500 to $2,800. You've got to offset, you've got to look at how many times am I going to go to the doctor and what's that cost difference going to be for me. And so as I've gone around and briefed all of our employees, I've gone over this and explained to them, go back and look at the explanation of benefits that you've gotten for the past year and sit down and do this analysis um, for yourself. The third option, and this is the option that you know requires uh, both boards to uh, decide on, is to take the Key Advantage expanded plan and replace it with a 250. The 250 plan is halfway, but the premium and benefits are halfway between the uh, expanded and the 500. And so as you look at the deductible, it goes from 100 to 250. When you look at the office visits, they're $15 or $20. Uh, if you go see a specialist, it's a $10 uh, difference. Inpatient facility deductible is $100 difference. Uh, outpatient's $50 difference. Um, the benefit of this to the employee and employer is that we're looking at about an eight and a half percent lower premium uh, by making this change. And so if we're talking about a 20 and a half percent increase, if you were to implement this, the employees that uh, stay in this plan and move from expanded to 50 are basically looking at a 12 uh, percent increase for next year. However, the uh, Second column here, the 176, 602, 1067, those are the actual premiums that a school employee is paying today. <coughs> the next column uh, reflects the 8.5% difference that they uh, that would be paying if we had the 250 plan. And you can see that it, the employees are saving either 15 a month, 51 a month, or 90 a month. And the last column is just their annual savings. And so for employees to weigh in on the survey to say, is this an option that I would like, they need to look at the 180, the 612, and the 1,080 uh, savings and see how that compares to their increased cost if they were to go to the 250. And I want to point out, these are the savings to the employee. School board share of the savings, this 8.5% difference is $146,000. So that's, again, a uh, you know, big ticket item for uh, so it's, this is something that we need to think about. This last slide here is just for the employee's um, benefit to look at, and I just have some samples as to what their cost, uh, increased cost would be uh, for, for example, the first one, employee goes to the doctor um, twice a year, paid $5 more in a copay, so that's $10, goes to a specialist once a year, uh, that's a $10 difference. Uh, goes to an outpatient facility, and that's cost them $50 more. So you take those costs of $70, subtract it from their savings of $180, they still net at $110. Obviously, if employees uh, are on, use um, health, their health insurance a whole lot more, if they have you know more serious, you know, issues on a lot of drugs and stuff like that, prescriptions, then they may want to stay with the expanded plan. And so, as I said, we have surveyed our staff and uh, we have not completed, we've not closed out that survey yet, and so I haven't analyzed it to see uh, what they're looking to do. But we will be doing that over uh, the next uh, budget meetings that we have with the board. And um, so we wanted to present this information uh, to y'all as well tonight. So any questions? Mr. Tucker, do you have questions? Or do you yeah, they're running on my ears. <laughs> no, not right now. So, Larry, so, I, so sooner, I'm sorry. Uh, so sooner or later, after you've analyzed the, que the questionnaire mm -hmm. and then take a shot at the number who would select each one of these, you're going to come back with three sets of numbers for the two boards to consider. Is that where you're going? Uh, yes, sir. I do plan uh, to uh, do a presentation at the next school board meeting on the survey results. And obviously, we'll, we'll 
will be talking about this each of our budget meetings. So, so you'll take the number that you use each one of the three scenarios from your survey and plug it into a formula to come up with a bottom line number. Because that's what we got to get to sooner or later, right? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. and I really won't know the bottom line number, though, until I get that quote, right. you know, for what the premiums are really going to be. Uh, but, but I can, for these scenarios, uh, plug in, you know, what the costs are going to be uh, if we're still at 20 and a half percent. Right. Right. And so your best guess is going to stay at 20 and a half percent? Don't know. For, for that's now, that's, that's the data that I have. Yeah. So, so, so what I'm getting at is uh, would, you, would you use 20 and a half percent and then do a scenario of 25.5% and a scenario of 15.5% so that we can see the worst case and best case scenario. Well, and let me. You, I know you can't get that yet from the insurance company, but we still need something in their head as a placeholder. All right, well, let me, what I would suggest right now, we use the 20 and a half. And the reason I say that is that even if worst case, our next quarter data has a higher number than that, David Rowe, the consultant that we both use, has done a wonderful job for us over the years in that each time Anthem uh, comes out with a number, he's been able to bring that down a little bit. So even if it goes up, I'm hoping he's able to negotiate with them and keep it at about 20 and a half. But I don't know that. And I can't so you're answering you know, my question, that. 20 and a half is the number we plug in, in initially, right. even right. though it's not an official number. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, we plan on doing a survey for the county employees. Uh, we we certainly are. So, so I have a couple of follow-up questions. So, so Larry, why uh, is it not one choice to do? The companies I've worked for the last several years all have wellness programs for a long time. Mm -hmm. It was a way to help defer cost, mm -hmm. and so again. I participate in when I go to get my physical, we turn in actually, we get $100 if we do that for turning our physical and they don't look at the data to see whether we're healthy or not healthy, they just say you did it. Right. So right. We, you know, we give you a little kicker that they right. encourage us to do that and we say we don't smoke and mm -hmm. all the other stuff that we're not supposed to do. So wouldn't, wouldn't that be something you could do in conjunction <coughs> with looking at some of the other options that are available? We could do all three. We could okay. do all three of well, these. I would, I would it, think it's would. not, and the survey's okay. not written to where it's like, pick one, two, or three. Okay. We can do them all three if we choose to. Okay. Well, and then on a, typically on a high deductible plan, and again, that's one of the things my company is proposing to all of his employees. Unfortunately, there is no match from the company, but they're trying to encourage people to move to the high deductible plan. What, what I think we've heard from our employees is that the deductibles you've got to reach, if you're not prepared to reach in your pocket for it, to, to get to your $4,800 deductible, mm -hmm. maybe some money in a lower income bracket of, you know, where the disposable income is going out for house payment, car payments, it's tougher to be able to have that out of pocket money until you build your house saving account up, you don't have those monies available to you. FSAs, you at least can Correct. anticipate a little <coughs> while I'll get it up front and it'll, I'll right. keep con contributing. So the cha that's a challenge with an HSA, I think, is it's really, you know, it makes you nervous if you're somebody who doesn't have a, a decent amount of disposable income available to you to right. cover the expenses until you reach the deductible. Mm -hmm. and of course, you have all maximums, and God forbid, anybody has a catastrophic health issue that can devastate you, and hopefully, you reach your maximums mm -hmm. and then you, everything's covered as close to 100%, but never covers everything. So, right. uh, HSAs to me are good options for, but uh, some employees, some, some, yeah, some employees, <coughs> yeah. right. uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, just a comment on that. Uh, th there's been some, uh, th you know low-level chat about how um, if there were a way to uh, fund a little bit of a nest egg with with that kind of a, a structure that that might mm. alleviate some employees uh, I guess reluctance to move in that direction so for example um, if, if in, in lieu of 70 a month a deposit was made for eight Eight, I guess 840 would be the annual cost. You're fronted 840, and then the, then the county contribution's done, and then that's available to you. Now you do get into the issue of well, what if, what if you separate from service, and what do we do with that? And maybe there's some ways to, you know, to, to address that. But conceptually, if one were to have that 
mm -hmm. up front, then when your your copays and what came in, you'd at least have that to pull from during that that year. And then if you didn't pull from mm -hmm. them, then you're really set up for right. the next year. Mm -hmm. Then you've got that nest egg, and hopefully it rolls forward. So that just something else to think mm -hmm. about as we think about program design and and dealing with some of those. Uh, some of the nervousness of employees to go in that direction. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Dave, go ahead. Let me, let me follow up on Ted's thought because I hadn't considered that. <coughs> but if we put in the, for example, on the county side, the total contribution right at the beginning of the year for somebody and then we're done, then they have emergency, a medical emergency, and then they go in and they use all of that, as you said, you know, the second month. And then the third month, they, leave us how would we get that back yeah I, I think that's that's a place where we can't and and you, you know I, I don't have a great answer to that <laughs> no, um, so there's some risk in doing that and the and the, no the question is can you structure it so that that risk is sufficiently low enough that the benefit is net positive and and you you would hope that you wouldn't have very many cases of that I wouldn't want any <laughs> understandable, un understandable, and I don't frankly know if there's a a, a legally enforceable way to I wouldn't think to so. say that if you've fronted this and then you owed it back if you departed. I, I just you don't never you never see it. I don't think. Yeah. But let me see if I understand. I'm having a sidebar with my colleague, Mr. Cole here. Uh, so what you're looking at is providing employees with three options: the three <clears throat> that you reviewed with different types of savings going against that projected 20.5% cost increase. Is mm -hmm. that correct, Larry? Uh, yes, but some employees could uh, do uh, more than one option. Uh, I mean, they, this last option that we've talked about, the expanded to the uh, 250, 421 of our uh, employees are in Key Advantage expanded. So if that choice is made, it, it's a choice made for uh, those employees. Um, the uh, they can do the health savings account and wellness. So, I mean, yeah. any yeah. any employee could do, do well those two that. together do or just, the, just one of the three. But you're comfortable that, you know, regardless of the combination of choices that we're offering, and I like the idea of the three choices that you're, you're putting forward, that there would be a significant savings decrementing that projected 20.5% increase. Yes, there would be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, so the, just one quick question on HSA. Does the uh, employee have an option to make a don't make a deposit into their account? Let's say anticipated, maybe they got a great Christmas present <coughs> from their parents, and they wanted to put it in the account. They could. Uh, some plans allow for a deposit to be made. Um, well, we haven't worked out all the details for all these accounts. I, okay. I do know that if you already have a HSA set up, you can transfer the money in. But right. I wouldn't want to answer that question okay. until we... Some plans uh, do have the ability right. to, for you to make a you know, deposit into it. Right. Okay. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Right. Uh, Joe. There's two questions. I, I know you can contribute in, in addition to the $70 mm -hmm. monthly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But is the is the flexible spending account and the HSA are they mutually exclusive? Or can you yes, you cannot. You, you can't. Can, well, uh, number one, under tax code, you cannot have an HSA unless you're in a high deductible plan, and also you cannot have an FSA and an HSA. You um, so yeah. Yeah, if you currently have an FSA and you move to the high deductible and, and start uh, health savings then you stop putting money into your FSA. You can still spend the money you have set aside there, but uh, you can't participate in both. And thank you for asking that question because I did not point that out earlier. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Boyd, go ahead. Hey, Larry. It's always good to have another Larry in the room. There's not enough of us. Amen. Oh, yes, there are. <laughs> there's too many. There's, there's one too many, but we'll leave it up to you to decide which one. Um, I'm going to zoom out just a little bit and ask you a question that you may or may not be able to answer, and that's fine. <clears throat> but um, I'm very concerned, to be honest. This, this has been a good presentation, and I thank you for doing it. Um, I'm, I'm really getting concerned here uh, as I think about these numbers, et cetera, 
And it's my opinion, Mr. Kunk and I were, were kind of chatting about this, that the cost of health care and pensions is the next national crisis. And how is Powhatan County going to deal with this as America ages out, including our county? Um, teacher pay. I'm really concerned about this. Uh, I was a high school teacher for a few years, and I've, I've held the paychecks in my hand and watched them melt through my fingers all too quickly. Um, this is going to affect teacher pay. Mm -hmm. So here's my first question. Is the state doing anything about this? If so, have they communicated to you? Do you know anything about that? And if not, we'll bend the ears of Mr. Ware and Mr. Sturdivant and maybe get something going there. Um, I've not received any communication about the state doing anything on health. Uh, you know, the last two years, the state did propose that uh, and they do, did direct the uh, Director of Human Resources to uh, draft up a, uh, a health plan that was similar to the state plan for school division and localities to join. We did uh, throw our hat in the ring uh, through the first two phases of that, uh, but just to see what the numbers would turn out to be. The premium numbers for that plan was much higher than what we're paying through Anthem Local Choice. So um, uh, whether the state is doing anything beyond that, I don't know. But to uh, reinforce your concern, and another reason why we on the school division side are concerned about this, our biggest uh, expense in our budget obviously is salaries. Not mm -hmm. a surprise, I, I think all of us would answer that. Yep. The second, uh, largest expense is VRS, retirement, and that is for all of our full-time employees. The third expense is health insurance. Only 72% of the school division employees participate in health insurance. Next year, with a 20.5% increase in health insurance, and we're getting a slight decrease in the professional rate on VRS because of their returns, mm -hmm. health insurance is gonna move to the number two place in our budget. And so that is cause for our concern and cause for us to look at this to see what can we do to try and influence um, the claims that are being you know, used, influence our employees to have more skin in the game by moving to a high deductible and managing their expenses and making the smart choices as to how they use those expenses. Do I go to emergency room Do I, or can I wait till in the morning uh, to go to see my doctor or maybe person, patient first instead of a, an emergency room and, uh, you know, those type things. And so that's why we're looking at it because it, it is a big number. It's pretty clear the rules of the game have changed. Mm -hmm. We can't do it the old way. And right. I, it, it's time to think outside the box big time. Um, my follow-up was, uh, and actually this is as much for my colleagues up here, but the county budget impact obviously since between 60 and 70 percent of our money goes to the schools is <laughs> we're gonna have to wrestle with this so um, we don't have to just think about schools the the five of us think about the rising cost of ambulances and the rising cost of textbooks and the rising cost of building a school or bumping out a courthouse um, rising cost of fire trucks etc which they're all above the rate of inflation so when you ball all this up into one, um, this is a sig significant problem, and I don't think this should be lost on us. Um, so basically, I think we should get out ahead of the problem, is what I'm saying, and not just let this meeting pass by as just <coughs> another meeting, but maybe come up with some sort of um, holistic to the county action plan so that we can incorporate all these changes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Larry. Yes, sir. Thank you, Larry. Larry, um, just so I understand, so having been a small business owner and had provided insurance to my employees, mm -hmm. the challenge I faced was I was, you know, 38, 38 employee operation. And then I, when I saved some money, I partnered with a, a retail food dealers association to coin that group and get better premiums because right. there were more people. Mm -hmm. So we're part of this group, but yet our, our claim increase is result of the claims we had last year. So you don't, it doesn't mold itself into the group to get a, an average increase for a group. So where's the advantage of going with the group? If you if they single you out, do they single you out as Powhatan? 
with just claims because the first part of the data said we had this many claims and it increased 37% or whatever it was. So the, we get advantage of the group um, and uh, with the 140,000 employees um, and the things that are group rated for the 140,000 are the um, dental and um, pharmacy claims uh, as well as the administrative fees and that kind of stuff. We also get the advantage of the group in that um, the rates, the increases and decreases that we've received over time um, have also been based upon the um, retained earnings, if you will, of the entire group for Anthem. And so sometimes what that means is that if we are, if our claims for just Powhatan are driving a 20% increase, they may come back with just a 19 uh, or 18, which has happened many years, uh, so that we stay with this group. And then years where there's been, the data would drive a 10% decrease, they even that out over the years rather than just making us pay everything all that year. So we get the advantage of it that yeah. way. Uh, but I think the biggest thing in answering the, your question as to the group benefit are the uh, pharmacy and um, the dental claims and administrative fees. Okay. Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Yes. I too, like Mr. Norvig, are very concerned by the green bar graph on your chart. Mm -hmm. That's a shocker to me. Mm -hmm. And this is not a us versus y'all. Right. It's all of us in this ballpark together and all of these people here are going to pay for it <coughs> eventually. Better minds than ours have been, must have been struggling with this issue. Are there best practices that we're missing completely that other localities or other entities are using? Because what I don't want to happen is us to be in this room next year and have another green bar on top of the green bar and we scramble like y'all have scrambled in this and you've done a good job of doing it to help us understand. But every year the green bar is going to be at 20% on top of last year's 20% or even 15% on top of last year's 20%. Where does it stop? It pauperizes the community eventually. Who is the best, where you go to find best practices of how other organizations and other entities and other localities are struggling through this exact same issue? Um, what many employers have done on the outside is they have gone to the high deductible plans and those are choices that their employees have made. They've gone away from uh, plans that are very lucrative like our Key Advantage Expanded. Um, when the Affordable Care Act first came out, we were concerned that the expanded plan may fall under the Cadillac tax. They've not yet issued the numbers for the Cadillac tax, and they won't until 2020. But just looking at the numbers that they uh, talked about, um, it would fall slightly under the Cadillac tax if they do issue the numbers in that area but it's still a very, very lucrative plan. And so what other employers have been doing on the outside is uh, decreasing the benefits of their plans. May I, may I? So the three scenarios that you shared with us tonight, mm -hmm. are they part of the portfolio of attack on this problem or yes. are they just stopgap measures? The, there, these ideas, and, and quite frankly, if somebody else has another idea, we'll, we'll consider it. These were just ideas that, you know, in talking with David we, and looking at what some other school divisions and other employers are doing that we've come up with. And one of the questions in the survey to employees is if you got another idea, lay it out there for us. What these are all designed to do is to uh, improve how employees uh, use the, uh, their health insurance benefits with the goal of them not having, you know, such high costs, making smarter decisions so that in the future, when we do get our renewals, they won't be 20%. They'll be less than that or maybe go back to some of the years where we had a decrease. But um, 
you believe that? <laughs> I <laughs> can only hope. <laughs> you get a decrease, you let me know. I want to make sure that, uh, that everybody understands this is not an attack. Mm -hmm. This is an attempt to understand and look mm -hmm. forward to working together, oh, right. all of us working together to try to do what we can to protect our employees mm -hmm. and protect the taxpayer. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Tucker's issue is not new. Right. This has been going on, how long, Larry? Since the Old Testament, it seems like? Uh, whenever they started insurance, uh, I don't know how long, when that was, but. Yeah. but I'd, I'd like to answer Mr. Tucker's question, which you can do, is you can go up to Washington and demand that they fix it, finally. <laughs> this has gone on for years now, years, and we still don't have the fix. Larry, correct me if I'm wrong, Anthem has pulled out of some states, haven't they? Uh, they, <coughs> they have, in some states, they haven't pulled out <coughs> coverage for employers and groups, what they did is for employees that have to go to market under the Affordable Care <coughs> Act, the they pulled out, you know, providing that coverage. So, Chairman, you know, Mr. Right. Tucker, I think we're at the bottom of the ladder <coughs> in a situation where it's being passed down to us, and I think what I'm hearing Larry say, saying is that they went out there and they looked, they polled other entities like ourselves to come up with solutions to be able to pare back the cost and these options that they're bringing forward is what their investigative uh, results show that these are our best options for reducing costs is that correct Larry right there and there are other divisions around us that have these benefits and I've also over the you know last five or six years talked to our neighbors uh, like Chesterfield and uh, Richmond City that they do bid their insurance and I'm telling you, when we've sat here and we've, you know, looked at, you know, a three and a half percent increase, and I've talked to them when they've faced uh, many years of double-digit increases, we're a whole lot better off. But again, now we're facing a 20, a potential 20 percent increase, and so. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, one last one, and I'll, I'll make it pretty quick, Larry. Um, Powhatan County is pretty good at being proactive. I, I like a lot of things the way we manage money. And right now I'm thinking about we have a capital maintenance reserve fund in this county mm -hmm. so that when we have a need to build a school or um, you know the HVAC goes out or something like that, uh, we have a reserve fund and that money can <coughs> deflect <coughs> the, the cost um, of surprises, that kind of thing. Uh, we also have the line item now in the budget for the school board that if the schools don't use all of their money, it sits there with an earmark on it so that they know they have a reserve. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a great idea as well. And, and uh, I'm just, I'm gonna ask the question, you may not know, but something for us to think about. Is there a possibility, is it legal to have a kind of a reserve fund for, dedicated for healthcare, that if we have some large jump um, you know, Powhatan kind of takes care of itself. Uh, the state's still not providing high-speed broadband internet, so we went out and did it ourselves. A lot of localities are still waiting. Is it legal to have an account set up that would draw interest that we could use for fluctuations in health care and not have to put it on the backs of the teachers, et cetera? It Thanks. is legal for the uh, Board of Supervisors to designate a reserve fund for uh, uh, any issue to include health insurance. Uh, as far as uh, earning interest on, you know, that account, I mean, you earn interest on your account all the time anyway, so yeah. I don't see any problems um, with that. There is, when you talk about a long-term plan, there are some um, localities and school divisions in the state of Virginia that have gone to a self-insurance model, right. uh, and, and they have set aside a lot of money in order to pay, you know, claims, and they will have uh, some insurance, uh, an insurance policy for catastrophic claims, but otherwise they manage the claims with that pool or fund that they have set up. And the savings that you're getting out of that are your administrative fees. And so um, we've not looked at that option and, and I would need help in doing that to determine, you know, how much cash would you have to have to get started on something like that because I would imagine that would be significant. Thank you. 
Chairman. But, but you say that, sorry, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> but you say that the savings would just be in the administrative. You're talking about $346,000 right. per year. Right. And that would be the sum total of the savings of such a program? I, I think so. I mean, I, like I said, I would need some other experts to, you know, help us analyze this and to say is it good for Powhatan or not. But um, at this point in time, because of how much money you'd have to have set aside, I don't see it as a, a I think a, the cost is short term solution. At the size we are, we probably not. If we were a larger jurisdiction, it might right. you might could say, well, the cost is the cost, and the, but I don't think this size. Anyway, Jim. Go ahead, Jim. Um, I'm going to try to phrase this carefully. The, the, the goal of this is to encourage, and use the word encourage right. people to go to a high deductible plan to modify the way they use the health care system, and that is what results in the savings. Mm -hmm. for, for myself, uh, about three, four years ago, that decision was made for myself and all the employees that that's the only plan that's offered. What I would like to know, and, and I think we have enough data to determine this, if you take our top five or so uh, individuals or families that uh, we don't know, we don't want to know names, but we do know dollars and types of, of procedures that were that were used in a given year. What is the out-of-pocket uh, that they experienced under their current plan, and what would it be? A way to determine that to determine the actual impact in real cases that we have data for because I would like to know that to help make a decision of do we eliminate a plan and, and, and make the choices uh, more towards HSA I'd like to know that well let me respond to that with two things one is that those employees that I've talked about on one of the earlier slides that were the catastrophic catastrophic claims those employees maxed, they achieved their maximum deductible out of pocket. Um, the other way that I would respond to that is that we have three different plans today. This recommendation or proposal is that in the future we'll still have three different plans. The three plans will either be Key Advantage Expanded, the 500, and the high deductible, or it'll be the 250, the 500, and the high deductible. There are employees that, we have employees that there is no way they should go to a high deductible plan because of the claims they have. They need to stay in one of the other plans, either the expanded or 250 and the 500. And so as long as we don't eliminate those two plans, those employees that are big users that need the coverage should stay in one of those other plans. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, if I could, the, yes. the school board felt the impact of this presentation at the end of October, and it is a very sobering presentation as we talk about a potential for a 20% rate increase. So appreciate the information that you've put together and shared with both of the boards this evening. Uh, one of the things that I will offer is I have asked Dr. Jones a few moments ago if he would share the survey instrument that we that you have used for our staff with Mr. Voorhees in sure. the hopes that they will use a similar survey instrument. I think that will help mm -hmm. both of these boards together as we talk about looking at the data to keep it as close, the responses as close as possible to the same types of questions. Because I, I think that there is a tremendous amount of value in asking the staff, the people who are most directly impacted by what we're talking about, uh, in a personal way as far as the type of insurance that they will have and the deductibles and other things for their input and comment. So, and I certainly echo the comments of the uh, other board members that we are talking about a very, very significant issue here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if could. Yes. Um, just a couple of comments here. And, and, and like Mr. Walters has said, we've, we've seen this now for about a month, and I, and I think it is, it's very concerning and to a point heartbreaking to me to, to think that some of our employees are going to bear this increase in health insurance cost. But at the same time, I am concerned about the 28% of our school employees that don't use our health insurance at all. And this is going to impact all employees regardless of whether they take insurance or not. <clears throat> and we have to keep that in mind as we move forward. And, you know, 
at the, at the other side of this, we have to keep in mind also that right across the little grassy area here next to us tonight, the free clinic of Powhatan open, is, is open tonight because there are lots of people in this community who cannot afford any insurance at all. Yep. And so, you know, we are grappling with a serious issue, but we do need to keep it in perspective that, you know, we're very, very lucky that we're providing insurance at all. And, and we're very, very, you know, and yes, it's expensive, but just keep that perspective in mind, you know, as you walk out the door tonight or, you know, if we leave early enough, there'll still be people parked over there who are, who are looking to get medical services because that's the only place they can go. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Any other comments? Okay. Larry, thank you for your presentation. Yes, sir. And, uh, glad the gentleman stayed home. If he's sick, we sure don't want to be using insurance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. We'll now move on to 10B, discussion on Pocahontas Middle School repurposing, found on page 18. And I'm on, you know, yeah, um, Mr. Tibbs, Tibbs is going to um, come up and lead this presentation. Um, this is a, um, a result of um, what both boards asked us at the last joint meeting to come back with some numbers and a more concrete plan. So we, we've been working with county staff uh, to get that information. Um, and Mr. Tibbs is going to walk us through uh, where we are currently uh, in terms of what we're proposing. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So as Dr. Jones just stated, this is iteration number two of the PMS repurposed presentation. If you'll recall the first presentation, there were many comments and many things tossed around, so we encapsulated that and, and went back and, and tried to do a little more legwork. So the first slide highlights our collaborative efforts that transpired from our first meeting. Um, the Public Works Department and I met on October the 25th. Community members did a PMS walkthrough on October the 31st. The Christmas mother stopped by, the representative of the Christmas mother stopped by on November the 1st and, and we had a discussion. Met again with the Public Works Department on November the 7th for a PMS walkthrough of the gym building. And then we also did a central office walkthrough of our central office facility right down the hill here. And then last week we had a collaborative meeting again with the Powhatan County Public Schools, the Powhatan County Public Works Department, and community members. And so this map here kind of highlights what we have come up with, in particular what we're proposing or asking you to consider this evening. If you'll look, there are three different colors on this map. The gold color is multi-purpose use section. That is currently in existence our gym facility that houses the gymnasium as well as the band area. The orange section is uh, part of the main campus of the school. That is um, to highlight and to make sure that we utilize and, and look at space where the old Pocahontas High School was as well as the old Pocahontas Elementary School was. The gray area are the areas that we ha are highlighting now for future use. So when you look at that map, these were the considerations utilization and preservation of the old Pocahontas High School and elementary school sections, utilization of the areas that are serviced by the existing 2007 chiller and the 2011 boiler systems. If you'll recall the first presentation, there are two separate systems, both chillers and boilers. These highlighted, the gold and the orange area, are on the newer chiller and the newer boiler system. The gray area is on that really old boiler and chiller system. Repurpose of existing office spaces. Part of that Pocahontas High School currently houses our administrative offices as well as guidance counseling offices, so we would repurpose those areas. It also houses the uh, library section and some classrooms, art classrooms and things of that nature. The old Pocahontas Elementary section is predominantly classrooms, so we would look at converting and repurposing those current classroom spaces. The proposals for the Repurpose of Pocahontas Middle School is for Powhatan County Public School administration offices to have be housed in that location. This would provide for consolidation of all staff as we have staff out in our current school facilities as well as in some trailers behind Powhatan Elementary School and Pocahontas Elementary School. It would also provide us with meeting and training spaces. Right now we do not have any meeting or training spaces large enough so we utilize large classroom spaces that can be opened, dividing walls can be opened in classrooms to hold meetings and things of that nature. Oftentimes we also have to wait to the end of the school day 
in order to utilize those spaces. Exhibition space to commemorate Pocahontas High School and Pocahontas Elementary School. And Powhatan Parks and Recreation would utilize the gym space and the subsequent fields behind and beside the gym space. So this evening we're coming back to you with some, a, a little more solid figure, if you will. Last time we met, we discussed from the CIP some placeholder numbers, so we feel like that these numbers are a little more solid. The potential renovations, the estimated cost for those would be approximately about $358,000. Those renovations under number one include the building envelope as it is an older building and some things would need to be repaired, doors and windows, interior wall finishes, flooring, ceilings, HVAC, just some minor changes with repurposing classrooms into office spaces, communication and IT equipment and then inspections and testing and furniture. The second item is a roof replacement. In the chart there, the roof replacement is only for those sections, the orange section and the gold section. It does not include a roof renovation for the future use section. That complete roof replacement of the occupied sections with an EPDM of 60 mil with a 20 year warranty would be that $390,050 figure. If you were to look at a total replacement of the entire roof over the entire campus, all sections, you would be looking at approximately $645,000. Also the HVAC replacement, if we were to utilize the entire building to repurpose the entire thing, you would be looking at approximately a, an estimated cost of $1.2 million, which is why we are proposing to look at utilizing the spaces that currently have the newer systems, that way we can use those. Additional considerations, the county government is interested in using our existing school board office for departmental offices to reduce leasing space. We would look to potentially begin work in August or September of 2018 once we move out the current staff and the current students uh, into the new middle school and look at projected completing in spring of 2019. And we are also looking to add this as part of our capital improvement plan. The next slide is a slide of interest that we were asked to get some numbers for. If you are looking to look to, I guess, study the value of these particular uh, facilities that we're discussing. 2320 Skaggs Road, which is our current administration building, you're looking at a proposed assessment value of about $547,000. 4290 Anderson Highway, which is the address of current Pocahontas Middle School. This is just the gymnasium, the soccer and softball fields, and the tennis courts. You're looking at an assessed value of $2.15 million. So roughly proposed assessment value of $2.7 give or take a few a million dollars would be the assessment value for these two pieces of property. So issues for consideration. How will the ownership of the repurposed middle school be divided? Who manages the unused sections of the building? Who identifies new uses for it? Tenants, purposes, etc. How do we assess the value of the properties being transferred from the school system ownership to county ownership? Additional items, unused sections of the building must remain temperature controlled minimally to prohibit freezing. We currently have a dual pipe system in all sections of that building and it's an intertwined system. So even though that we're saying that we're gonna utilize the newer systems, the older systems would still need to be minimally operational so that we prohibit freezing in those areas. Unused sections of the building would remain secure at all times and there are no major renovations or adjustments needed to the site. For example, the parking lots are in good order, the landscaping is in good order, and also accessibility for public use is also in good order. Any questions? Okay, uh, a little bit concerned with the unused portions of the building and what the threshold is in, in our climate zone for preventing mold growth and something that could become very expensive or potentially unusable in, in any areas that aren't somewhat temperature controlled or humidity controlled, that, that would be one of my main concerns. Great point. And rem remediation is not cheap either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, I, don't, I don't want to get ahead of your presentation, but you're through. Is, is yes, sir. One of the things we've talked about now for a number of meetings, going back to when Pat Wilder was here, 
You talked about a master plan for all the different buildings here in the county. What were we going to do with them? If we move, for example, the school over to the middle school, what do we do with that building? So the systemic process of moving the pieces around and being able to prioritize, you know, things like do we want to get out of spaces where we're paying rent? Is that a priority? And looking at the utility of the building based on you know needs that we have here in the county both on the school side and the county side so my question is when do we get that master plan so we can look at all the pieces and have something in place where we can see what the overall cost is going to be not doing it incrementally as we move from one place to another but what the plan is for the county as a whole i don't think he's are you asking Mr. Tibbs that it's question? A question or is it kind of all of us. It's group? a question to all of us. It's not so that gentleman can't. Didn't want you feel like we put you on the spot yeah. much, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm good. I'm on the spot. Yeah. 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 Okay. If he can Hang answer, it. it might be a promotion. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> if you're smart, you'll leave that alone. Just uh, David, I hear you. And, and uh, I kind of see this as a first step in that process. Uh, I, I think maybe, and, and this is just me talking. Uh, that that this is kind of the first step of that process. If we feel that maybe this is a good start in the thought process on, okay, so it's way we're going to allow the schools to uh, bring this plan forward, work on the dollars to in the CIP to be able to start this process, then I see it as a next step. Then as we as the county will say, well, while we know one of the things we've always said is let's get out of rented buildings, and then we have limited, limited uh, we people spread all over the place, then, then the county would say, well, here's what we're going to do with our, with our facilities that we have, and how does that fit into, you know, do we relocate? Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you, Bill. I just, I don't want, you know, when we had the conversation multiple years ago about the renovation of the junior high, we knew there was going to be a cost for whatever reda uh, adaptive reuse of that building. We knew it was going to be a cost. And so what I'm saying is I'd like to get all the costs out there if we're doing a five-year CIP, be able to project and plan if I need to do renovations, for example, to, for the old school administration building, I'd like to be able to factor that in in our five-year CIP and plan for it and make sure I have capacity available when the time comes. I agree, and I think that's some of the things that we need to decide. Is it relocation of facilities? Is it relocation of... E911 in 10 years from now, what is it and what does it cost to do to those buildings? And, and uh, are and we going to use any of the school at all yeah. for county offices or are we going to allow it to be used for? Well, we, yeah, that's why I'm saying, you know, I'd like to go ahead whatever. and have that joint planning, you know, with the schools and us to be able to identify, you know, what our space needs and to be able to look at those space needs against, you know, what we will have available with the middle school. And if I may, I'll ask just yeah. One more question. Going back to Jim's question about, you know, keeping and having temperature control in the unused sections of those buildings. What's the cost of that? And are we, do we have some idea going forward that we're going to use those sections? And if we don't, um, what's the cost of maintaining them, temperature control or whatever versus tearing them down? I mean, if you've done the architectural review and done the assessment, is it really feasible to keep this? If it's not feasible, then we need to know it and move on. David's asking a series of questions to which he does not expect an answer tonight. <laughs> Thank you. It's true. It's true. Mr. Chairman. So, go ahead, I'm sorry. One of, the, one of the things that could answer or help answer the question is if we could somehow try to determine if there's going to be any commercial interest in renting space in this building in either the areas that we don't find uses for or the areas going into the uh, future use portion of the building. It, it, there's a lot of empty rooms. Um, maybe there's some uh, commercial uh, tenants out there that might uh, use it as office space or uh, storage space. Help pay the bills. Well, Mr. Chairman. Would um, I'm really pleased with the the work that has been done first of all by the um, schools and the county of, of a first initial plan. I think that's great. We're making progress. So now, would the second part be to um, have Mr. Tibbs or uh, find out how much 
we would need to replace the boiler and the heater and um, for the other section that you're talking about. Now, the reason we moved out of that was because it was too expensive, I thought, mm -hmm. okay, um, on the school side. And then um, the other thing that concerns me is if commercial, we were gonna have to be careful about what businesses were going to allow there because there's an elementary school very close to that um, building. So we'd have to watch that. Um, would that be a next step solution? So, so I, I see it. I, I kind of feel like that the schools have said to us, here's, you, here's what we want to do. Here's what we will, this is what we want to do. We've given, they've given us some numbers that are, they're all not etched in stone, but they're starting place for numbers. Mm -hmm. So the schools have said, we want to use this to relocate our, mm -hmm. uh, our administration offices, get rid of the yeah. trailers, uh -huh. all those things, and uh, they put the figures together, incorporating that it would also capture one of the goals to make sure we kept the uh, older part of the school to capture the history. Mm -hmm. I think that was important to myself and many of us sitting at this table. Mm -hmm. So that that's all part of your plan. So y'all, they've kind of done mm -hmm. it. So I, I see we've, to me, we've made that first step. The second step for us would be, okay, so if we're okay with that plan, then what happens with, to Mr. Williams' point, what happens with the rest? Mm -hmm. How do we want to repurpose it? Are we going to support the Christmas mother and allow them to have part of that? Or would we move county offices <coughs> there? Or do we move them to the administration office? To Mr. Williams' point, how much does it cost to re renovate this or that? Uh, so I, I see we've kind of we've gotten from the schools mm -hmm. exactly what y'all said mm -hmm. we, you know, we're willing to do. I also see that that we um, we need to understand the long-term needs, as Mr. Williams said, of where we are today. We we have rented offices, and I can tell you this board's been all about you know making sure we're not wasting money by putting you know rented offices when we have we'd have facilities available um, so uh, you know that's one of the goals that we started with so is the administration office that so I see we kind of got step one from the schools this did, Jane, did mr. Tibbs did this capture any of the train savings that was presented that was presented I think our last joint meetings there was some savings based upon Correct. the train proposal Tr train is still working on numbers at this point we have not received anything from them uh, they've met with myself and, and toured our facilities. I know they met with Mark with the Public Works and, and they've toured the, the county facilities. They are still working to try and get something to us in December. Okay, uh, so, so my question would be, would the facility, the, the study they're doing for the, the current facility that's up there, yes. are they going to do it in one big fell swoop to say the entire portion or just what y'all are interested in? I requested they do the entire portion. Okay. Is it possible to break it out into two, if possible? I'm sure I can ask them to. Yes, because you got two different, you got several aging systems. When I, when we were up there and, and we walked around, they actually were scratching their heads, going, "Why do you have two systems here when they're so close together? You can probably tie them in together and and have one system." So they may even come back with that, but I will certainly so ask then, them that. So then the savings that you could apply there would be again spread out a little Correct. differently as, as far as cost. Mm -hmm. One other, um, one other piece of information to share, um, and Mr. Tibbs, you may have the exact number, but um, to Mr. Williams' point about the Skaggs Road property, mm -hmm. we have had in the CIP for the uh, last few years HVAC replacement there, I believe. Roughly 100,000. Yeah, mm -hmm. 95 to 100,000. Um, and I believe that's the only cost that's that we would anticipate thing. that building mm -hmm. needing. The parking lot was just redone. Right. The offices and other Roof is facilities. Still good. Roof mm -hmm. is good. So it would be. Um, that would be a number to, to consider with that Skaggs Road property that's in our CIP. Mr. Chairman, we're, in my judgment, we're making this thing more difficult than it needs to be. It seems to me that if we get five people in a room, Mr. Tibbs representing the school administration, the NAACP who's approached us and are ready to make a presentation tonight on the use of the property, a representative of the Christmas mother, the county administrator from the county office's point of view, and parks and recreation. And we use this map of this building that we've seen now for over a year, and we start putting placeholders on the map. Forget costs for a moment. What do we want to do with the property? <coughs> if indeed we agree with what, then we ask they can answer the question how. To me, we're, we're doing the work of the committee here. We're trying to 
think of everything possible about who's going to use it, whether we're going to use outside businesses, how much is it going to cost, is it salvageable, et cetera. Why don't we decide what we want, what we agree to in principle. We can always back away from it, but we got to start somewhere with a stake in the ground. And this is a beginning of that, but it still falls short of what I want to see. Mr. Chairman? Yes. To piggyback on Mr. Tucker's statements, I thought we were doing that. I thought we were moving in a direction where we had directed staff, mm -hmm. the schools, the county to move forward. Schools have come forward with their recommendations. I think now what we have to look at on the county side with Ted and his staff look at what we're going to do or what our needs are and how we can potentially backfill in these available properties and what exactly do these properties offer the county in terms of our space needs again prioritizing <coughs> things based on what our needs are the utility whether or not it's rental space etc we can do that and i'm, I'm confident that Ted and the staff ramona they can, they can continue to bring that forward Mr. Chairman, go ahead, Larry. I'm going to add. Um, <clears throat> ditto for, for both of them. Um, I was on the middle school committee. Mr. Tucker was on it. Ms. Zemel was on it. Rick was on it. It seems like forever ago that we were looking at the same diagram, and it, it wasn't color coded yet, but it's been a long time. I feel like we're moving to, way too slowly, and I'm not looking at you when I say that, Jason. I just think, in total, this is taking too much time. We've had a lot of advanced notice that this school was gonna be repurposed and I think it's time to kick it into high gear. Thank you for bringing the school plan and numbers so we can react to that and add it into our thinking. I think on the county side, for whatever reason, um, we need to put the numbers together like Mr. Williams has been saying. We need to get the big picture, all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and then we need to make some doggone decisions on who goes where. And I think we ought to put a timeline to that. And I think it ought to be accelerated. I don't really want to have this conversation many more times. Maybe one more little final review or something. But if we need to resurrect a portion of that middle school committee or, or yeah. whatever to just yeah. generate some action, and I'm willing to meet every week. Um, but, you know, I'd rather be audited by the IRS again than have these Christmas mothers throwing snowballs at my house <laughs> on the 25th of December. So, um, you, you know, heard, you haven't heard about global warming. Have you? <laughs> yeah, snow on Friday. Spraying water on my house the 25th of December. No, I really. Um, there's some groups out there that want to know what the heck we're going to do, and I think we owe it to the citizens. Um, they're the boss, not us, and I don't think we're being very good public servants dragging our feet on this. So I would suggest that we work up a plan on the county side uh, with a timeline to make some decisions about where the school goes. And no, I'm not grandstanding. I really, really feel badly that we haven't solved this problem already. I'm right there with Mr. Tucker. Okay. Thanks. So the, the here, here's may, the, I, may I piggyback on Mr. Norvick's go ahead. just a sentence? Even if the Christmas mother gets an answer, no at least you'll have an answer and you can go on with your life. Even if the NAACP gets an answer, no. The NAACP can go about what it needs to be done. We owe it to folks to help them get on with their life, including those of us who sit up here and do our budgeting process. So, so uh, I hear you, and I hear you, Mr. Norvig. I agree with you. However, it would hard, be hard for the county to determine where they, what use they wanted for the school until the school was kind of shared with, with, with their uses. So I see we have step one on the process. <laughs> so the second step is for the county to say, just ask Ted. Ted says he, can, he and Ramona can put their plan together and have it to us January 31st at the latest. I think, we've ca I think the committee has done what the NAACP asked, and that was to make sure they were recognized. We haven't seen their presentation, but make sure that th that history is preserved in that school, and I am in support of that and will always be in support of that. And so that is part of what Mr. Tibbs and the school is committed to. I expect it to take place. So really, to me, the, the only other identity that has approached us in very passionate, very detailed fashion is the Christmas brother saying, hey, we want to, we'd like to find a spot. And I, I, I'm committed also that we'll figure that out as this county. We figured out a lot of things over the years. We will figure it out that's best for the majority of the citizens. And 
I have some thoughts on some locations that maybe work better than the school, but I don't want to say those until my staff has done their work. And, uh, you know, but I think we've got the step started. The schools have told us, seconds to the county. The county can come back and say, okay, so based upon their anticipated growth, for lack of a better word, if we want to use that term, term I hate to say growth, needs in the future, here's what we think we would need. And uh, we know that in 10 years, roughly, that we may need another E911 center. We just found that out when we uh, just upgraded the courthouse at 10 year life on that, maybe 15, but somewhere in that time cycle. So Ted, I guess you, if you're okay, I think we would expect something back in the next 60 days, less than 60 days, January 31st. I think we'll be able to, to meet that goal. Everybody okay with that? So less than, less than 60 days, we'll have a recommendation from the county. I'm in support of the plan the schools brought before us. I'm 100% in support of it, especially if it captures the history of, of the school and maintains that opportunity for the public to go in and see it. And, and, uh, and then we, we figure out the needs that we need as a county and how to morph in all the groups. So, yeah. I'm sorry, Ms. Eagle. Well, so then that means that the school board will take over the school as planned, and the um, two schools, the Pocahontas High School and the Pocahontas Elementary School, will be saved for historical reasons to put the school board's offices there. That's, that's a done deal then. Uh, I'm in support of it. Okay. You heard that, people, in District 5? That's a done deal. Yes, let's so clap. Have, so that, that well, it's for that the board is, members to <laughs> nod our heads with the yeah. chairman. He's one vote. I know he's the chairman. And he's okay, really, well, then do we really need persuasive. to take a vote on this? Do we need to take a vote? I don't, I don't know if we need a It's not no. really a vote. All right, so do we item. need to put it on the January meeting then to take a vote that that's what we're, the schools are going to do? Mr. Or does chairman, the school board do that I think at their meeting? A serious answer really is we do need to know the numbers, the money numbers of the other pieces of the puzzle, like besides the school admin building, other spaces that are, that are going to be involved, I think, here in the future. And uh, Mr. Kunkel was going to bring up something. Go ahead, Jeff. And my question leading into that, and I support both of these uses, but the, right now, this building is school board property. And my question is, how do we move forward and, and what kind of precedents or what kind of other counties can we look to that has a facility like this, it's currently owned by a school, and that is going to have this myriad of uses, some some of them still school related, some maybe county related, some mm -hmm. commercial, some historical. We need to find some guidance as to how to move forward. Do, cultural uh, arts we, center. We don't want to do something. Cultural <coughs> arts center in Glen Allen. That's a it's an abandoned school in Reichel who made it into a cultural arts center, which has classes, mm -hmm. it has arts, it has training programs, it has a store. Who owns it? This it belongs to the to the uh, foundation, Mr. So, Chairman. So, so one of the things I say is, those people sitting out there own it. Uh, it's the taxpayers' buildings, you know. And I, I don't get into who owns what. That, that bothers me. It's all these people sitting out here. We can figure all that out. It's done in Goochland. It's been done in other localities. I do understand if you add the commercial side in there, I do think it muddies the waters when you start putting private business into a building that belongs to a county, county whether it be county and I don't look at county as county government and school I, I fully understand the challenges but I see it as it's a taxpayers buildings mr. Yeah. chairman yeah. I thought that was going to be something that dr. Jones and Ted were going to work through and, and come up with a plan as to the sharing of responsibilities you know exactly how would it operate I mean I remember we had this conversation for a hundred years about the bus garage mm -hmm. and then when we finally decided to do the bus garage how long did it take Maybe 20 minutes. Well, they brought an MOU to us, and so I, I, I trust these two gentlemen. Y'all can get that done and bring something to the board in ways of in way of a recommendation. Yeah, I agree with you, Mr. Williams. And also, it took um, our last meeting was what September, from September to early December, for you guys to get together to do what you've done so far. Which I know it's rehashing stuff, but I think it's very good uh, progress that we've made. I agree. Very good progress. So let's let's get the county side, and then let's move forward. Where it's part, it's going to take. I, I wanted this done yesterday too, but we just we got to keep forward. Okay, we've got until 
August or September of next year. So let's get going so that by the time that the kids and the teachers are ready to move out of that school, that the citizens and um, county people can move in. So we have a commitment to, our county has a commitment to bring us something back January 31st in that time frame. Could be maybe we'll have a joint meeting okay. the 1st of February. We usually have some budget workshops uh, coming up that we usually do some joint stuff together and we would have a presentation at that time that we can digest along with you guys. Y'all have some input. Like uh, we did last time. And then we will figure out uh, at that point how we're going to proceed. And Mr. So Chair go ahead. Mr. Chairman, if I might, you know, we're, there's a lot of enthusiasm for doing these things, but just like everything else that we do, we all know that it's controlled by the budget. And though we commit to it, and we say we want to do it, it's like we commit we want to do a 10% raise next year, doesn't mean we're going to do it unless the funds are there. So I encourage the folks in the audience today, uh, if this is something that's, tr that's dear to you, then you need to be involved in the budget process. Your, your involvement does not end tonight. Uh, you know, as we move forward, you know, though these boards say, yes, we want to do it, there are some limitations as to what we can do and what we can't do as we move into the budget season. And we make priorities like everybody else. If, will these be, you know, will these make our priority list in the end when we have other things that are more pressing? You know, we just talked about health insurance a minute ago. Uh, so just keep those things in mind. I, I don't want to dampen Ms. Emil's enthusiasm over there by any means, but I do want to want to paint a realistic picture here of what the path forward is. Mr. Thank Cole, you, Mr. Well Cole. Very well said. I was going to uh, thank everybody for coming out tonight, as I usually do. And uh, as I look out there, when we passed a $102 million budget, we had four people sitting in the audience. Two people spoke, one for the budget, one against the budget. I look out here tonight, and I see much more than two. And uh, to, to Mr. Cole's point, sure is nice to hear from you as we work through all the budget issues. Uh, Ms. Harrison will understand that fully. So, any other comments on the schools? So, I guess Mr. Tibbs and next is going to give us the update on uh, on the projects. And I guess if you can save all of the monies that we've been talking about here, this thing will go a whole lot easier. I'm just giving you a carrot. All right, so this next presentation is, is uh, an exciting one, and I hope that you are able when you're driving by these projects to see the excitement that is going on there. Um, so this is a construction update for you for essentially all three projects, mainly the two, um, but I've got some pictures of the water tower in here as well. Um, this is a presentation for, for the Board of Supervisors that I do every month for our school board. And on this first slide of every month, I put the link to a review in pictures. I go out every week and I take a bunch of pictures of the of facilities as they are being constructed so you can see changes and, and see what's going on there. So I do encourage you to go look at that and, and encourage the public to look at that as well. On the left side of this first slide is the aerial shot of the project, the middle school project from back in August. I actually have an appointment tomorrow to take the drone up again and take some pictures and, and we're going to update those for next week. On the right side is from the top of the water tower. The steel erectors before they left to go to Culpeper to put up another tower in Culpeper, they went up there and took some pictures and shared them with us. I just wanted to know, did you, you didn't go up there? No, sir. Okay. All right. Same question. <laughs> Transportation maintenance facility has progressed very well. Uh, we received the temporary certificate of occupancy for the front section early in November. We received the temporary op occupancy certificate for the entire building today. Uh, so that facility is going along very well. The left side is the front parking lot. You'll notice that it is not asphalt at this time. We are going to maintain the stone until we get through the site work that is being done around behind the building, and then we'll do the asphalt. The right side is the entryway. It now has a Christmas tree there, but it is the entryway with the furniture in it and, and the uh, floors polished and shined and looking very nice. The left side is the back bay area. The bottom left corner, that is the pit lift. You'll hear that uh, exclaim, uh, hear people talk about the pit lift. Um, that's a pretty big piece of machinery that is down in the ground and, and they were there working it and doing things with it last week. It was very cool. The right side is the beginning of the site work for the whole parking lot area in the back. Uh, they started that last week and we now have stone from the back of the building down to the big 
pile of dirt, we actually have a, a thoroughfare going around that pile, so now the buses can loop all the way around and get up to the gas pumps. They have also started to uh, tear up, grind up, chunk up the concrete slab in the back of the bus garage as well. Can we pause after? Yes. If we, so, so anticipate the occupancy of the building, you will vac vac vacate the other building? Correct. Okay. And at what point will you start demolishing that building? There's got to be some abatement done first, yeah. and then they will start no, to... Not a surprise. And not a surprise. Then they will start to demolish the building. The intent is hopefully to be doing that by the end of December. Okay. And then canopy over top of the gas pumps? So people After that building it? goes down. Okay. Because mm -hmm. we're, we're actually moving the canopy over a little bit. Yep. And, and doing some But some you don't have to there. relocate the gas pumps or the no. tanks and any of those things? No. Tanks will stay. The pumps are, are going to be relocated a little bit as well. Okay. And the abatement was in the <coughs> proposal, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the transportation facility? So this is the water tower project, and she looks like a ghost. Um, this is actually the uh, skirting or, or the... the um, tarp that you will see up when they are painting. They have been working for the past several weeks now to get the, get the outriggers out there, weld in place all of the arms and things like that that they've got to have for the outriggers. And so last week they pulled it up for the first time. Um, they shared with us that there are several factors that have to be critical in order for them to begin painting. Uh, barometric pressures and temperatures and dew points and, and the whole nine yards. So. He shared with us that once he gets the outriggers and gets all that situated, he is probably going to go away for a little while and then come back once we get through the winter. But at least it'll all be in place. He said once he gets to going on it, we will be able to see some dramatic changes there. We did go into the bottom of it. He invited us to come into the bottom of it, and it's a pretty cool thing if you ever want to go by there. And he, he'll talk your head off, but you're, you're more than welcome mm -hmm. to go see him. Some more pictures of the water tower left, of course, is when they were um, doing the golf ball, as we call it. And then the right is another picture from the top of it. So Powhatan Middle School is progressing exceptionally well. Um, if you drive down Route 13, headed towards the courthouse uh, from that end of the county, you'll be able to see a lot of windows going in, a lot of, of external um, brick veneers and things of that nature. They are now starting to make their way around the front of the building. So the left side is a picture of the outside of the band area with the brick, different color brick and the windows in. That is the ramp that is going to be going up to the band area that they're working on there. The right side is the gym area. They were in there painting and doing some um, undercoating in there last week. This is also a picture of the performing arts area as well as the cafetorium, if you will. The left side is the band room. You can see that there's sheetrock up and, and we're starting to really look like we got some walls there. The middle section is the gym, I'm sorry, is the stage area coming off of the cafetorium and, and the cafeteria. And then the right side is just standing back looking into the cafeteria area. This is in the C section, as we're calling the C section. This is the middle section. The left picture is the second set of stairs, the, the set of stairs that will be facing Route 13, and, and as you go up, the students will be able to see out across the parking lot and out across the field by the Moose Lodge over to Route 60 and, and those trees. The middle picture is the, in the middle and the right picture are the inner pictures of the courtyard. The primary focus of the general contractor right now is to get that courtyard finished so that he can get out of there or they all can get out of there prior to the winter. Uh, so that we can button that down Better and hurry. not have to have a lot Better of traffic. I think it's getting cold next week. I know. <laughs> it's getting cold. As long as we don't have rain, we're good. Or snow. Snow on Friday and Saturday. No, no. <laughs> Continuing down, this is the left side. Um, this is part of, of the brickwork and, and part of the block work in the uh, media center area that's finishing up there. The right side is the front Beautiful. office area. On this slide, the left side, that we're getting into the heart of it now with the mechanicals. This is the boiler room, and the boilers are in place, as well as a fire suppression system piping. The right side are the external chillers, two chillers, and the uh, compressor, actually, the sorry, the generator has been set in place. And that's all. On schedule and under budget, right? On schedule and under budget.
perfect. Well, within okay. budget, I'll say that. Okay. So, if uh, so, I'm just curious. I, I bought a few bricks from the in the uh, fundraiser that was yes. done. So, can you tell me where my bricks are going to be? <laughs> I cannot. Not at this point. Come on, man. I will find out for you, though. Just curious. They will be visible, Mr. Melton. I'll okay. guarantee you that. We're actually looking at a couple different options for that in all seriousness, because I know it is a community issue. One would be in the courtyard itself, um, but also there's a wall um, right there by the gym, when, which isn't the most public wall that we're looking at, possibility of some um, brickwork there also. Mm -hmm. But not the men's room, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> I was just so happy when Mr. Cole told me my son graduated, so I thought about like a whole bunch of bricks to put yeah, in that yeah. building anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and it, James, thank you for the update on the projects. It, it is it exciting to me as you drive along the corridor there and you see the things taking place. And uh, they were the right things to do for the, for the long term success of this community. And, and it's exciting to see them come to completion. And, and uh, it'd be nice to see the bus garage get open and that, that building that just seems to outlive itself by 50 years mm -hmm. go away. You know, so uh, thank you for your updates. The one picture that is not in there is Area F and that is for, for the boards to know. Area F is a concession stand that, that you all uh, paid for to, to add to that project. So that is um, almost ready to, to have the roof put on behind Fantastic. the building. Any other questions of, on the projects? Do we have the dates um, set yet, um, Dr. Jones, um, for the uh, opening? Opening the, of? The garage. Oh, the garage. Um, we're still waiting um, to, uh, we just got the permit today, so we have to move all the equipment over, the staff over. I know, I know, but you said in spring. Uh, did we have a date yet? Oh, no, we don't have a date I yet. I, uh, um, Mr. Voorhees and I have talked about doing a grand opening of the transportation facility once the weather gets a little better and we've finished the paving that's going to be done and knocked down of the other building, so we'll sit, uh, definitely do a, a dedication is what we talked about at some point in the spring, so we'll get that date out. Um, Maybe by our next joint meeting? Possibly. Okay, thank you. Questions? Okay, any other questions of uh, staff, of Mr. Tibbs? Right. We're finished with our new business. We'll now move on to our second public comment period. Anyone wishing to speak, please come forward at this time and do the best you can to keep your comments to three minutes if you're an individual, five minutes if you're a group. Thank you. Good evening, my name's Andrew Sneed. I live at 3710 Maidens Road, and this evening I'm representing the NAACP Powhatan chapter. Thank you all for allowing me to have this opportunity to speak, and again, I'll use this PowerPoint so if you kind of follow along, and for the audience, I hate to do this, but I'll read it, just therefore, if you couldn't see it, I'll make sure everybody can see. One of the things when we started, as Mr. Tibbs spoke earlier, that we've been meeting since the last time we had this meeting with the joint boards and we've had a great meeting and great spirit and one of the things we talked about from the NAACP we said we will work for a win 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 and we are willing to do whatever it takes for the greater good of Powhatan County just a little historical perspective as you all all know the Ponca High School building was erected in 1937 has significant historical ties to our African American community and significant historical reference to our entire community. The building is a representative of is representative of the civil rights struggle and is a memorial to the African American community, who was galvanized, who who was galvanized to create educational opportunities, recognizing that education was a key to success not only for generations but for all succeeding generations. I love to hear at our meetings when the members, some members still who are, who are seasoned, like to tell that story about what they did and what their parents did and what their grandparents did to make sure we had a school for those students, for those African American students. I love that because that they, they talk about with pride, with accomplishment with commitment, with sacrifice, and that absolutely inspires me as well as the people around me, my sons and my family. Mr. Tibbs told you what we've uh, pretty much tentatively agreed upon. In the main office, 
and his, a historical marker adjacent to the main office detailing the founding of the Polka High School from the county school for African Americans prior to integration. Now I'll just show you a little picture. Right there, we'll have a marker, and that marker will be there forever. So when people come into that school board building, they'll be able to recognize with pride how that building, you know, the origins of that building. Mr. Tibbs again shows you the gym building. And in the gym building, down that forder, a historical gallery in the forder, a shared space with parks and recs in the gym building featuring photographs of Pocahontas School's rich history. In the band room, this dedicated space will be an extension of the historical display. This space can be used to house artifacts and documents that currently have no permanent home. Now, again, if you look at this picture, again, it's just, and I'll, I'll show you a, a better example, but in Henrico County at the Eastern Rec Center, they have something very similar. This is what they have up and down those foyers. So again, when kids come in those schools and their parents come in those schools, and, and to Parks and Rec, excuse me, in the Parks and Rec, they'll get the full value of history. And that's so important to us, not only for just the African-American community, but for the entire community. Again, in that band room, we'll use that and set it up for artifact and other things that we can use. But again, the shared space mm -hmm. is what we're looking forward to using. I told you about the win, win, win. Recognizing and, pres and the preservation of African-American accomplishments, that's a win. Community becoming strong and more cohesive as they understand and achieve the achievements and contributions of all community members, that's a win. And the community, then the county government building consensus and meeting the community needs in a cost-effective and efficient manner, that's a win. Just to summarize, again, I thank you all for recognizing the importance of history. I'm with you, we're all with you to address the current needs. But just imagine how this is going to benefit us forever. Again, I wanna thank all the board members, both from the school board, and the Board of Supervisors, both Mr. Voges and Dr. Jones for all of your help. And again, I look forward, we look forward, and I'm gonna ask all the members of the NAACP to stand, please. Mm -hmm. They stand, yes. So we look forward to working and doing whatever we have to do to get this dream completed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sneed, for your presentation. Anyone else wishing to speak, please come forward at this time. Seeing none, I'll close the second public comment period. We'll now move on to, we do have a county attorney sitting here. I guess you have no comments? Hello. Okay. Um, <laughs> short and sweet. Uh, County Administrator or Superintendent comments? <laughs> I just want to thank uh, the school uh, staff, superintendent, and board for presenting a, a very workable plan for us, and uh, we look forward to continuing this, uh, this planning process to, to bring uh, to conclusion as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Voorhees. Um, no, um, no comments except that we will be, um, um, when the transportation facility is fully set up, we'll um, get some information out to the county staff about when we'll start servicing those vehicles. Um, in all likelihood, with the holidays fast approaching us, it'll probably be um, shortly uh, once the new year starts, but we look forward to um, actually beginning that joint partnership. Thank you. Any board member comments? Mr. Chair? Yes. <coughs> I want us to remember that when this school was decommissioned, there was a plan on the table to demolish it. The county chose not to demolish it, but to repurpose it. And that's exactly the same kind of pattern we'd like to see happen with the middle school, and that's our intention. Thank you. Any other comments? From board members, the only thing I have is remind everybody of our, our uh, joint, I mean, our workshop that we have on the 7th. Uh, this week starts at 12 o'clock, and uh, we'll be there from about 12 to midnight, 10. <laughs> 
club to hopefully six o'clock, five o'clock. They two. usually three, two. So I just want to remind you about that. Okay, Mr. Chairman, if I yes. could, before Please. we adjourn, I just want to thank the staff from the schools, also from the county and the community as a whole. A lot of effort has been put into the the plan that was discussed tonight, or the proposal that was discussed tonight. And I think it's important to recognize that a, a lot of work went into that, and, and it is an excellent first step. And I would echo what several of the other board members said, that we, we are at a point we do need to bring some resolution to the matter. So thank you, sir. I agree. Can you answer any other board members? Have any? Does the school board have any comments? Ms. Emel. <laughs> well, I just, um, first I wanted to say that I have had a couple um, constituents um, ask me about uh, the motel, a possible motel being built close to the um, Pocahontas Elementary School. And so I wanted to know, um, are we going to be discussing that at the next meeting also? Or how does that, what am, what am I saying to these people is what I want so, to know. So I've already had my comment, but I guess I'll answer the question. Please so do. it will go through the public process just like any other public hearing. It'll go through uh, a, if they've had their community meeting, which is required. Mm -hmm. It will go through the planning commission and then it will come to the board. It'll start probably in January in front of the planning commission. They will do their work. And with the project as it and then make a recommendation to the board and then the board will do their work but it's you know it, it is following the public process just like any other rezoning would uh, with any other project so okay thank you mr. Melton okay. I appreciate that and I am just so um, glad to see all of the people here from the NAACP and from the Christmas Mothers um, programs to show that your interest in, in, in what's happening in your community. And gosh darn it, we're going to get it. I just know it. <laughs> Good night. Any other comments? If not, I'll entertain a motion from my board to adjourn. Please. Uh, all in favor of adjournment, aye. 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 Is there a motion for the school board to adjourn? So moved. Have a motion. Is there a second? We have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 We stand adjourned. Merry Christmas. I can say Merry Christmas. I'll see you on Sunday. I'm going to have a big meeting tomorrow with staff. Get us all the and then I'd like to get back to whatever you need, just call. All right?